Finally, let's apply conservation of mechanical energy to the torsional pendulum. Now, as a reminder, the torsional pendulum has a restoring torque, tau of t, is minus kappa theta, and kappa is the torsional constant. And associated with this, we have torsional potential energy, which is one-half kappa theta squared. And notice that this really mirrors the spring force, right? The spring force is minus kx, and the elastic potential energy associated with the spring force is 1 half kx squared. And so we see the parallel here, except, of course, in the case of the torsional pendulum, the oscillations involve rotational motion, and so we need angular position theta rather than just position x. And so, with that in mind, we can write mechanical energy at two arbitrary points in the rotation of this pendulum. I, I drew a disk, but it doesn't have to be a disk. It could be a sphere, a hollow sphere. It could be a rod. Um, and if we were to write conservation of mechanical energy between those points, we would write one-half I center of mass omega initial squared. Careful that you need rotational kinetic energy because it's rotational motion, plus torsional potential energy, one-half kappa theta squared initial, is equal to one-half I center of mass omega final squared plus one-half of kappa theta final squared. And of course, the moment of inertia I center of mass will depend on what type of object you've used to create your torsional pendulum. Pretty often it's a disk, but it doesn't have to be, so we'll just call it I center of mass. Now, point being, overall, you have kinetic and potential energy, and as the pendulum rotates back and forth, the mechanical energy gets distributed between kinetic and potential energy. And so just like we did for all the other oscillators, let's have a look at the graphs of kinetic energy and potential energy as the pendulum rotates back and forth. So at the endpoints, we have no kinetic energy because the disk, let's assume it's a disk, stops spinning and then goes back the other way at that point. So instantaneous angular velocity is zero, meaning kinetic energy is zero here and here. And then at the equilibrium position, no surprise, the disk is spinning the fastest it will ever spin, and that is a property of oscillators. The max speed is reached when the oscillator goes through the equilibrium position. And so that's why you have a curve for kinetic energy that looks like this. For potential energy, well, torsional potential energy is the greatest when the angle through which the disk uh, just spins is greatest, and so that's going to happen at the endpoints, right, where theta is equal to theta m, or minus theta m, doesn't matter, you're squaring it. And so max potential energy at the endpoints here, and then no torsional potential energy at equilibrium, because at equilibrium theta is equal to zero. Hence, this curve for the torsional potential energy. And of course, as we've seen previously, if you add both curves, you get mechanical energy, which is constant. And so pretty straightforward to graph uh, these energies or to infer from a graph um, who's who, essentially. And so that's just for graphing the energies. And let's finish up with what we've done for all of the other oscillators, which is write mechanical energy argue that it's conserved, and then take the derivative with respect to time to get the differential equation that describes the motion of the torsional pendulum. And that'll give us the angular frequency of the torsional pendulum, which we already knew because we've done this before with torque net equals I alpha. We're just doing it with mechanical energy. So it's a different way of getting the same answer. And so mechanical energy at an arbitrary point is going to be one half I center of mass omega squared plus one-half 
kappa theta squared. And this is a constant. Right? This, this entire quantity remains constant throughout the oscillation. And so if I take the derivative of both sides, I know that the left-hand side is going to give me 0. And the right-hand side is going to give me 1 half I center of mass 2 omega, but careful, omega itself is a function of time, so the chain rule requires that you multiply by d omega dt, plus 1 half of kappa, and then we're going to get 2 theta. Theta is a function of time, so you got to multiply by d theta dt. And recall that omega is d theta dt. So we get 0 on the left-hand side is equal to I center of mass um, omega. D omega dt is really d2 theta dt squared, same thing as alpha, plus kappa theta. Well, d theta dt is omega. So we can cancel out omega. And then we're going to get 0 if we divide by whatever's in front of the highest order derivative to put in standard form. We actually directly get the right form of the differential equation. No need to introduce a small angle approximation here. We just get the right differential equation directly off the bat. So that's d2 theta dt squared plus kappa over i center of mass theta is equal to 0. And because this is the right form, we know that this is omega squared. And so the angular frequency of the torsional pendulum is equal to square root of kappa over i center of mass. And as we've mentioned before, there's a notation problem. This is angular velocity, and it cancels out, but then this is angular frequency, and so if you don't want to get confused, call this omega zero, um, because again, there's a good reason why we use the same letter, but if you want to avoid confusion, you can label all the angular frequencies omega zero. Sometimes it's called the proper angular frequency. So there we go. We've uh, gone through conservation of mechanical energy for all of our oscillators, and if you look at um, the entire chapter, we started by describing them with torque net equals I alpha, or if net equals MA, depending on the type of motion, got the differential equation, omega, T, F, the frequency, the period, uh, the solution, uh, right? So the position as a function of time based on the differential equation. And we did that for all the oscillators. And then we repeated our analysis, but from the point of view of conservation of mechanical energy, for two reasons. The first reason is that, well, conservation of mechanical energy applies. And so we ought to understand how that relates to the motion and how to apply it in and of itself that's important but second because for each one of these classic oscillators there's a way to get this differential equation back by writing mechanical energy saying that it's conserved and taking the derivative with respect to time and it's a classic exam question it's an especially useful method if you start getting a bit of a crazy oscillator something that may be rolling without slipping and going back and forth with the spring or whatever, and we'll do some of those uh, in practice problems. And for those, it's just so much easier to go the mechanical energy route. It's really hard to get, if you have to apply F net equals MA and torque net equals I alpha simultaneously, it's really hard to not mess up a sign. Whereas here, you're not gonna mess up any signs, right? Mechanical energy, boom. And you get the right differential equation off the bat. So it's an important method and you need to know how to apply it for classic oscillators, and then when we do the practice problems, we'll see how to uh, do that with a specific oscillator that might be a little bit more complicated and uh, therefore a good exam question. Thanks for watching this video. We created Cogverse Academy to help you save time by focusing on what matters most when studying for exams. If you'd like to learn how Cogverse Academy can personally help you improve your grades, check us out at cogverseacademy.com and send us an email if you have any questions.
We'd love to help you.